In 1917, Russia collapsed. After fighting for three years against the Germans, Austrians, and Ottomans during World War I, the Tsar who ruled Russia in a top-down autocracy abdicated. He was forced to resign by the will of the people and the bayonets of his generals. In February, a government took its place, which also failed to live up to expectations. The provisional government failed to fill the shoes that the Tsar left behind. After a string of military defeats and an attempted coup by Russia's top general, the country was on its last legs, and Lenin's October Revolution was the final straw. In October of 1917, Lenin seized Russia's two largest cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow, and then quickly made peace with the Germans at the cost of the greater Russian Empire. Our story begins on May 14th, 1918, shortly after Trotsky signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, which effectively ended the war in the East. Soldiers left the front en masse. Trotsky's first order of business was to send German and Austrian-Hungarian soldiers home, along with the Czech Legion, which was made up of volunteers and defectors from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Trotsky and Lenin at first agreed on sending the Czech Legion to the Western Front by shipping them to the distant port of Vladivostok in northern China, where ships would be waiting to take the 47,000-strong legion to France. While in transit through Siberia, tension started to rise between the Czech Legion and the Bolsheviks, who wanted to disarm and disband the legion. Diplomatic relations between the Allies and the Bolsheviks also started to break down around the same time, when the Japanese, along with the British, seized the port of Vladivostok to protect foreigners living in the city, and to seize over a billion dollars worth of equipment that was meant for the Tsarist Russian army. The Czech Legion's train convoy stopped at the foot of the Ural Mountains, at the small town of Chelyabinsk, the last stop before the Siberian Plateau. At this town, the Czech legionaries were forced away as Austrian-Hungarian prisoners were shipped east from POW camps in Siberia. The POWs got priority over the Czech Legion due to fears of a Japanese invasion of Siberia. For a couple hours, the Legionnaires and the POWs intermingled while the trains resupplied. Both sides viewed each other as traitors, and hostilities broke out when an Austrian-Hungarian soldier threw a piece of heavy metal from atop top of a train car on the heads of several soldiers. The Czechs, who were armed, seized the train and forced the Austrian-Hungarian commander to hand over the soldier. The commander surrendered the assailant, and he was quickly dragged from the train and killed. A few hours later, Soviet officials arrived and arrested a few soldiers they thought murdered this Austrian-Hungarian POW. And they took these soldiers in question to a local courthouse and held them for three days. The legionnaires then sent an officer to investigate, and that officer was then arrested. The legion then stormed the town, heavily armed, to ask for their men back. The small 2,000-man Soviet garrison handed back the prisoners, and the Czechs waited for a train to Vladivostok. When Trotsky found out about the incident, he ordered the regiment to be disbanded, and had the leaders of the regiment arrested and forced to sign orders telling the men to surrender their arms. He also ordered local Soviets in the region that any Czechoslovakian found with a weapon in his hand should be shot. Trotsky then ordered that the Legion should be sent to Archangel instead of Vladivostok. The Legion viewed the change of plans and disarmament as a declaration of war and planned on shooting their way out of Russia. On the 25th of May, the Legion went on the offensive and attacked the local Red Garrisons and seized the cities of Pinza, Petrochemvosk, and Tomsk. Trotsky's distrust and paranoia of the Legion started the civil war in Siberia. The Legion's actions would turn into a rallying point for anti-Bolshevik forces all across Russia and pave the way for Admiral Kolchak. But where was Kolchak? For most of his life, he had been in the center of events. He fought in the Russo-Japanese War, led Arctic expeditions, and helped contain the German fleet during World War I. In 1916, he was promoted to Rear Admiral and took part in reorganization of the Navy. In 1917, he threw his sword into the Baltic upon finding out about the Tsar's abdication. The provisional government then sent Kolchak to America as an attache to the U.S. Navy. On the voyage back to Russia, he received news of the fall of the provisional government and the rise of the Bolsheviks. Kolchak and his small entourage were conflicted. They were out of the job and in the middle of the ocean. Instead of returning to Russia, Kolchak went to Tokyo and offered his services to the British at their embassy. He asked to fight on the Western Front as a soldier, feeling obligated to finish the war even if Russia withdrew from the conflict. 
The Allies at the time were trying to hold the Germans, who were throwing their full weight against the Allies. The British were fighting in France, but also simultaneously not letting Russia fall into anarchy. The Allies intervened wherever and whenever they could. They invaded the North and supported the Baltic states. They also armed groups in Georgia and Armenia and sent money, guns, and equipment to any army that was resisting the Bolsheviks. In the opening days of the Civil War, the only openly armed group that was opposed to Lenin and the Germans were the Cossacks, who kept fighting the war, but were untrustworthy in the eyes of the British. Kolchak, on the other hand, was a man they knew well. He was a person they could trust. The Admiral spent years studying the British Navy and battleship design. He had a reputation uh, as a man of honor. The British military wanted to use Kolchak. They first planned on sending him to the Middle East to take part in an uprising in Georgia, but they changed their mind and sent him to China. Kolchak wrote that, I consider it to be my duty as one of the representatives of the former government to fulfill my obligation to the Allies. That the obligations which Russia had assumed to the Allies were now my own obligations also. I therefore consider it indispensable to fulfill them to the end and to desire to participate in the war even though Russia under the Bolsheviks had concluded peace. The Allies were conflicted on what to do with the Russian question. During the war, the Allies sent material, weapons, and money in a vain attempt to save Russia from themselves. In the wake of the Civil War, France proposed an expedition into the Russian heartland with a coalition of British, Chinese, Japanese, French, and American forces, like in the Boxer Rebellion. Britain instead wanted Japan to solely launch an invasion of Siberia from Vladivostok, a plan that the Japanese High Command deemed impossible. They calculated that it would take over three years for an army to be properly supplied in the Urals. Both expeditions were shot down by the Americans, who even in 1917 were worried about the Japanese expansion in Asia. During World War I, Japan annexed German territory in China and the South Pacific, but spent most of the war expanding their economy and sitting idly by as the Allies threw soldier after soldier into the meat grinder of the Western Front. The Allies also made attempts to get the Bolsheviks to enter the war against the Germans, which Trotsky and Lenin were against, deeming it suicidal. Even if they did enter the war, the Germans would crush the poorly equipped and organized Red Army. In early 1918, the Allies seized the northern ports of Archangel and Murmansk, the last open ports in the country. By the end of the war, the Allies decided that defeating the Bolsheviks was the only course of action to maintain a balance of power in Europe. With Germany defeated and Austria partitioned, the borders of the Russian Empire were free at last from Russian rule. And the last thing that the Allies wanted was a Bolshevik state that was predatory looking to reclaim their empire. They wanted a vassal, an ally, someone they could work with. The Bolsheviks were a wild card. In southern Russia, Deakin took command of anti-Bolshevik forces. In the north, the Allies occupied the key northern ports, while the breakaway states of the Baltic, Poland, Ukraine, and Finland armed themselves, not wanting to be swallowed back into the Russian Empire. In the east, in northern China, an vindictive, violent, and cruel cavalry commander named Atman Simoyov rallied troops against the Bolsheviks. He claimed that his army was made of Russian exiles, hell-bent on taking back their homeland. But in actuality, he led a band of 600 Mongol tribesmen, Japanese cattle rustlers, and Chinese bandits. They fought, looted, and burned their way along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Simoyov spent his military career in the steppes of the Russian Empire, fighting in Persia and the Caucasus during World War I. General Baron Wrangel, one of Russia's best cavalry commanders, stated that Simoyov was an exemplary officer, especially courageous when under the eye of his superiors. Simoyov rode with the equally demented Mad Baron, the would-be last Khan of Mongolia. Together, they would unleash a wave of terror and corruption across the Siberian steppe. At first, they were able to defeat the scattered Red Militia, who were unmotivated and poorly led. At the battle of the railway station of Kimskaya, Samoyev was defeated by a Red Army commander, who freed Austrian-Hungarian POWs and pressed them into his ranks. The war band was defeated, but Samoyev's raid proved to the Allies that with the proper support, Samoyev could lead his army to victory. The British, French, and Japanese threw in their hats with the general. They gave him arms, money, and soldiers. 
the Japanese gave the most support by sending in artillery and infantry as volunteers. Slowly but surely, his army turned from a group of bandits to a mercenary army. Russian officers and aristocrats flocked to Samoyov, believing him to be the only person to save Russia. This was not the case. Samoyov was viewed as a liberator, but in fact he was a despot who used British and French money for his own personal use. He was not the man the Allies thought he was, but they kept sending him weapons anyway. Instead of fighting the Bolsheviks, Samoyov turned himself into a warlord. Kolchak arrived in China and was sent to Siberia by a Russian railway corporation who wanted a general to save Russia. Upon Kolchak's arrival, he found scattered war bands and corrupt military officials that were more concerned with looting, pillaging, and exporting opium than liberating Russia. Kolchak met with local war bands but failed to gain support for waging war against the Bolsheviks. The Japanese, who oversaw the warlords, distrusted him. They did not want the armies to unify. The Japanese generalship was making millions upon millions of dollars selling opium, and they did not care about the liberation of Russia. Kolchak did not play politics. He did not offer promises to the Japanese on giving territory after Russia was liberated. So without these promises, even though they were flimsy at best and were only verbal promises, the Japanese grew to mistrust him. He was not a player in this game of exporting opium, in this game of corruption. He was an outsider. In central Russia, the Czech Legion was a rallying point for what would be later known as the Green Army, which was a breakaway from the Soviets. The Greens were made up of traditional land reformers. The Legion's ranks during this time grew to around 70,000 men, thus making them a major player in the Civil War, despite most of the soldiers simply wanting to escape the chaos, but they were forced to stay and fight. The Legions were first ordered to unite the army, which was scattered over 5,000 miles, with a portion of the Legion in port at Vladivostok waiting to be shipped to France, and the other half along different train stations on the Volga River. The Legion received messages from the Allies that they were coming to save them, and that if they regrouped and sat tight, relief would come. In reaction to the Legion and the Green Armies, Lenin ordered the execution of Tsar Nicholas II and his family before they were rescued by the Legion, which was starting to advance. If Nicholas was freed, he surely would have become a figurehead for the liberation of Russia. Despite the Tsardom being viewed as the cause of the war, famine, and pestilence that plagued the land, Nicholas was still popular among the peasantry, who viewed him as a semi-divine figure. After the death of Nicholas II and his family, the Legion came across the Bolshevik Gold Reserve that the Soviets sent away from the city out of fear of it falling into German hands. By midsummer 1918, the Allies realized they needed to get involved in the Civil War, believing that the Reds were an extension of the Germans. The Americans, French, British, and Japanese sent troops into Siberia. The Americans sent the 27th and the 31st Infantry Division into Russia under General Robert Graves. The British sent the 25th Middlesex Regiment, nicknamed by their officers as the Hernia Battalion, due to the soldiers being mostly middle-aged and under-equipped. The British only gave them fur coats for the winter, and they did not provide tents or mosquito nets for summer conditions in Siberia. The French sent around a thousand men from Vietnam. The Italians actually sent a small expeditionary force also, which is kind of interesting. And the Japanese committed several fully equipped divisions into Siberia. The British sent the Russian military affairs expert to lead the expedition, Major General Alfred Knox. Knox followed the Russian army throughout the war and personally witnessed the disaster at Tannenberg. The French sent their Russian advisor, Jeanne, who had been an advisor to the Russian army since 1896. Jeanne saved Paris during the Battle of the Marne in 1914 and was the military advisor to the Tsar. The Japanese sent their best general, General Onatani, a veteran of all Japan's wars of expansion. And he played a, an important role during the Russo-Japanese War, and he was a very skilled staff officer. The coalition of generals distrusted each other, and also the Russians, who they were supposed to save. The American general, Graves, along with several other Allied armies, refused to commit troops against the Bolsheviks. Instead, they had them garrison the Trans-Siberian Railway. Knox was a longtime friend of Kolchak, and found him in Tokyo, sidelined by the Japanese, who did not trust him, but allowed him to stay in Japan in exile. Knox convinced the Admiral to join him in Siberia, right as Kolchak was about to leave for southern Russia to reunite with his family. The Admiral left with Knox and Sigurd to the front to help with the expedition. Knox brought Kolchak to the green capital, 
where he was immediately given the position as Minister of War. Knox then left for the front and found the Czech Legion in despair. Kolchak arrived shortly after. Trotsky had mobilized more than half a million men into the Red Army and threw wave after wave of his army against the Legion, who were unable to replace their losses but could hold their own, but just for a limited time. Upon the end of World War I in November, the Legion wanted to head home. Their goal of liberating Czechoslovakia had been achieved. Most of the soldiers had no interest in fighting yet another war. Kolchak cared little about their suffering and used them like pawns on a chessboard. His mistreatment of the Legion would ultimately lead to his death less than a year later. Upon returning to the front, the government of Omsk was collapsing with ministers fighting each other for control of the government. The army approached Kolchak and wanted him to seize total power. Kolchak refused, not wanting to get involved because he knew little about the Siberian political situation. Despite Kolchak's refusal, the army planned to instate a military dictatorship when the moment arose. In November 1918, rogue Cossacks kidnapped several of the Umsk leadership. The government then held an emergency session and concluded that their government could not control the military and decided to surrender their power to the army. The ministers put it to a vote on who would assume power. Three military leaders were on the ballot. Two were seasoned Western Front generals and the other was Kolchak. The ministers picked Kolchak because he had a reputation for honesty. With Kolchak firmly in power, the Allies and the white Russian enclaves scattered throughout Russia believed they found their leader, and the Allies claimed that he was the supreme commander of all of Russia. Kolchak's government was founded on notions of law and order, but in actuality, it was a military dictatorship run by the elite of Russian society. They punished the local populations and committed war crimes against their own people. Upon seizing power, Kolchak arrested the Cossacks responsible for committing the coup, but allowed them to flee the country. This incident made Kolchak look weak and indecisive in the eyes of his fellow generals and the world. Sensing weakness, Simoyov threatened to break away from the admiral's government and form his own country in Siberia. Kolchak temporarily fired Simoyov and planned on going to war with the rogue warlord, but the Japanese intervened and sided with Simoyov. This proved to the admiral that his own generals and allies could not be trusted. In late December, Kolchak launched an offensive against the Reds and took the city of Perm, which gave the Allies hope that the Admiral could link up to Archangel, where U.S. troops were garrisoned. Kolchak was against linking up with U.S. troops in Archangel due to the poor condition of the roads and the little supply in the region. His officers suggested a move south, towards Deakin, instead. But before Kolchak could launch an offensive, he needed to reorganize his army. The Czech Legion had to be replaced, with raw recruits due to their army being in an almost state of mutiny. The role of the Legion changed from frontline combat to garrison duty along the Trans-Siberian Railway to counter the increasing number of guerrillas that were sabotaging the railway lines. But these guerrillas were not communist. They were just anti kolchak They were mostly bandits that refused to be drafted inside his army. On paper, the Admiral's government looked like they were going to be the victors of the Civil War. Kolchak was a decisive leader, and he had total control of the government. One would think he could quickly reorganize the army with the help of the Allies, and together they would raise and train a new army and march on the Bolsheviks. But in reality, Kolchak ran a slow and incompetent government. His generals and ministers backstabbed and killed one another. Officials openly embezzled funds and corruption ran rampant throughout the country. Weapons and supplies that the Allies dumped into Vladivostok disappeared due to poor logistics. Government and railway employees did not get paid, despite the Admiral having over a billion dollars in his personal possession. In late December, the railway and military officials tried to coup the Admiral's government, and there was an open battle in the streets of the white Russian capital. Kolchak's government won and arrested the ringleaders, but released them shortly afterwards, showing to the rest of Russia that he was too weak to lead. Regardless of the instability, the Allies stayed involved, pumping weapons into the black hole of corruption that was Kolchak's government. On top of everything that the Admiral went through, he failed to accomplish coordination with the other white armies. The whites in Finland won their civil war and told Kolchak in exchange for independence they would raise an army of 100,000 men and seize the vital city of St. Petersburg. The Admiral refused and planned on going to war with the breakaway states upon reaching Moscow. He was going to stitch together the Russian Empire one body at a time or die trying. Kolchak also refused to have World War I veterans serve in his ranks, 
believing them to be infected by Bolshevik propaganda. Instead, he used teenagers from Siberia who could not compete with the experienced Red Army soldiers, who were mostly made up of World War I veterans. 1919 was the year for the White Russian movement. The Allies committed large bodies of troops and weapons to the White Russian enclaves. Each army made a dash towards Moscow in one way or another. Kolchak, on paper, had a sizable army with Allied advisors training this new army in machine gun tactics and infantry formations. British soldiers manned his artillery. Knox was also in the process of training an Anglo-Russian infantry division that would be led by British officers. In mid-March, Kolchak had around 132,000 men under his command. More than half of these men were local militia that garrisoned the Trans-Siberian Railway. The Reds had around 100 and 20,000 men across various railway junctions around Siberia. Kolchak pushed down three separate railway lines at once. Each railway line ran towards the Volga River. He initially beat the Red Army in front of him, due to him having a 4-1 to artillery superiority. The British manned artillery made short work of the Red Army, and Kolchak took more than 100,000 square miles of land back from the Red Army, and he captured more than 20,000 prisoners, some of these prisoners would actually join Kolchak's ranks, thinking that the Red Army was on the cusp of defeat. The Admiral believed that the Reds were retreating, but in reality, they were regrouping and shifting militia by train to the Urals from other fronts. Trotsky, upon gathering enough men, ordered his army to counterattack. The Red Colonel under SS Kamenev broke Kolchak's army, who was overextended, with some divisions hundreds of miles away from their supply lines. The Admiral then spent the rest of the year retreating, losing the key city of Perm by mid-July. Despite his best efforts, he could not hold off the Red Tide. Men deserted his army en masse, fleeing for their lives. The Allied troops refused to follow orders and moved to the port of Vladivostok to leave Russia. Several attempts were made by Kolchak to ambush the advancing Reds in the dark forests and endless valleys of Siberia, but the Admiral's generals were too slow or incompetent to pull off any maneuvers. The Allied officials visited Umsk only weeks before its downfall, just in time to see the chaos of the Admiral's government. The Allies decided to abandon Kolchak to his fate and withdrew their support. In November, Umsk fell to the Reds and the government fled in exile. By 1920, Kolchak's army was 200 miles behind its original starting point in March. The offensive had failed. The army deteriorated and the remnants of Kolchak's army embarked on what would later be known as the Ice March. Trains got stuck in massive traffic jams along the railway, which forced the soldiers to march on foot. Most of the men died of, of the snow or of typhus that ran rampant through the ranks. The remnants of the White Army moved to the city of Vitursk in Siberia, about 1,500 miles away from Omsk. Red forces in the area quickly took the city, and Kolchak was betrayed by the Czech Legion and the French general Jin who was arrested by the admiral and handed him over to the Reds in order to save their own lives. Jin blamed Kolchak for the collapse of the White Army in Siberia and claimed that he failed, mostly due to a cocaine addiction. Kolchak was then briefly interrogated by Soviet officials who oddly wanted his life story for a prosperity and interviewed him for several days. On February 7, 1920, he was unceremoniously executed and thrown into a carved ice hole on the Yushikovka River. The remnants of Kolchak's army would flee into northern China and try to build new lives forever exiled from their homeland.